Isaiah 6 is a deservedly famous chapter. It's inspired several contemporary songs. Uh, scholars classify it as a called narrative in which God commissions a prophet for a certain job. And Moses had his call at the burning bush. Moses, Moses, take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. Uh, Jephthah the judge had his call. Jeremiah had his. Paul had one on the road to Damascus. Uh, they're all different. Uh, we're not sure where Isaiah was when he had his call. He refers to the temple, but that might have just been part of the vision, not necessarily where he was in real life. But still, uh, that's the setting for uh, what he sees and his call. Uh, even though it was in the temple, though, he, he starts in kind of a, a secular way. He tells us when it happened according to the year of the king. That's the way dates were normally given back then. In the year that King Uzziah uh, also called uh, Azariah, uh, in the year that he died. Well, that was 740 B.C. The people didn't know it at the time, but the death uh, of Uzziah marked a decline in the nation of Judah and a rise in the power of Assyria. In less than 20 years, Assyria would invade the area, force Judah to pay tribute, and take the northern tribes into captivity. Isaiah is telling us that this is when he was called to be a prophet. He was called to preach at a time when the nation was going into a decline. Now, he may not have known it at the time, but he was called to predict problems. And he successfully <laughs> predicted the failure of the nation. Here's his vision in verse 1. I saw the Lord high and exalted. That doesn't sound like it's has enough emotion. Yeah. <laughs> this must have been a stupendous vision. Uh, words fail. Uh, we don't have the words to describe what he saw. He didn't have them, so he didn't put them there. He saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Some translations say the hem of his robe. Uh, either way, the point is that the temple was filled with only part of his robe. Uh, the temple wasn't big enough to contain the whole robe, certainly not him, uh, the, the Lord as well. Uh, he must have been outside, up, above. His robe represents majesty, glory, power, and it flows down from him and it, it fills the temple. And above him, Isaiah says, uh, were some seraphim. This is the only passage in the Bible that talks about this category of angel. Uh, he actually gives a better description of the angels than he does of the Lord. Uh, the angels, he said, each had six wings. Uh, two wings, they covered their faces. Uh, two covered their feet. I don't know what this symbolism means. Uh, wings were supposed to be for flying, and that's what two of them did. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, this is a shout. The Lord Almighty is holy, holy, holy. I can't do it justice. <laughs> Isaiah says it shook the building. <laughs> so what is this holy? It means separate, set apart, worthy of worship. He inspires awe, admiration, respect, obedience, and even fear. It's not a whisper, <laughs> but the sound of the voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook the temple. And the temple was filled with smoke. This is like a volcano. Uh, the voices were booming. It was no ordinary dream. It was a powerful communication of God's presence and power and authority. And notice Isaiah's reaction. Whoa to me. I cried, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He was keenly aware that he was not worthy of his vision. He was not good enough to be in the presence of God. He said, I'm doomed. I'm a goner. I saw the top secret, and now they have to kill me. It's a bit like Peter. When he had been fishing all night long and hadn't caught anything, Jesus comes along and says, oh, try it again. 
Peter catches so many fish that the boats get full and about to sink. And Peter says, go away, Lord, for I am a sinful man. When people are in the presence of God, they know they're not worthy of being there. Perhaps they're a bit afraid that God might punish them for their sins. Even though they know he's good. It's interesting, Isaiah says, unclean lips. What's he referring to? Dirty words? Maybe. I I think it's more of a way of saying that we can't even talk about God accurately. Uh, We don't have words for him. We just have to make do with what we have. Our best attempts are only pointers. Uh, We kind of apologize for our best attempts. Even when we succeed at talking, we fail at doing him justice. We fail to convey the grandeur that (coughs) is reality. Isaiah felt inadequate to even see what he was seeing. Well, one of the angels had a solution for that. Verses 6 and 7. One of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, uh, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched Isaiah's mouth and said, This has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. Uh, Didn't say it burned his lips, but it cleansed them. Took away Isaiah's excuse. And now comes this purpose of the vision in verse 8. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom will I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, hmm, send Bob. Um, He might do a really good job. Uh, No, no. Uh, God was not asking for advice uh, as to who he should send. It was just a way to get involved. Uh, Isaiah says, you know, God is asking for help, basically. This glorious, powerful, stupendous God is asking Isaiah. If he wants to be involved. And Isaiah, with his cleansed lips, is able to give the right answer. This is the response of somebody whose guilt has been taken away, whose sin has been atoned for. This is the response that God wants of Isaiah and of us today. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to say yes to every opportunity that comes up. We don't have to say yes to every person who asks us. Uh, Those people aren't God. Uh, But we do need to consider the possibility that God is speaking to us in a situation. And if God wants us, we should be willing to go. You know, we might be inadequate for the task, but God can take care of our deficiencies. What he wants, though, is that we are willing to to do what he wants. And God calls different people in different ways. Uh, Moses in one way, Jeremiah in another, Peter one way, Paul another. Uh, We don't all have a conversion story like Paul. Uh, We don't all have the same job as Paul. God works with us as individuals, not as cogs in a machine. We each have a part to play. And often we don't even know what we're being called to. We're we're like Abraham, who was called to a country that I will show you. Jesus told Peter, I will make you catch people rather than fish, but he didn't give them the details right away of what was going to happen. He did warn Paul that he was going to suffer because of Jesus. Uh, We can't expect any particular pattern to the way that God commissions people for Uh, the work he wants us to do. In my own case, if I had been told ahead of time what I was going to do, I don't think I would have agreed to it. (laughs) I think many of us have had the experience of going down the wrong path for a long time, only to find out that it was the wrong path. On the other hand, maybe it wasn't. (laughs) Maybe the most important thing is that we were willing to go. Uh, even if we didn't understand the instructions very well. We were failures at one thing, but successful in the most important thing. God can take care of the details later. That what he wants first is a willing attitude. And we see that with Peter, for example. Uh, Peter got a lot of the details wrong, uh, but Jesus was willing to work with him. The Bible has several stories of people who did the wrong thing, uh, But God worked with them anyway. 
And overall, we count them as a success, even though they weren't perfect. When God calls, we answer, uh, here I am, send me. I'm willing. We don't say, well, tell me the details and I'll see if it suits. You know? We just go. We, we, don't know the, we do know the final destination, as uh, Ezra was talking about. It's very good. But we don't know all the twists and turns along the way. In Isaiah's case, there's more to the story. Uh, in this case, God had warned him, uh, warned him that he wasn't necessarily going to like this job. Uh, now first, he told him what he was going to say. We see that in verse 9. Uh, he said, go and tell this people. Here's your message. Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Go tell the people they're idiots. <laughs> uh, well... Can you imagine that? You know, what, can you, if you were told, uh, you're tell, telling people, hey, listen carefully because you're not going to understand. Look carefully. You're not going to know what you see. Uh, well, there's two ways to understand that kind of command. Uh, one is that it's completely pointless to look or listen because there's no way that you're going to understand. There's really no point in looking and listening. And there's really no point in telling people to do it. <laughs> The other way to understand the verse is to see it as a call to listen carefully. Because it's going to be hard to understand. Isaiah would, might be uh, paraphrased as saying this. Uh, you folks have been hearing what the prophets have been saying, but you're not listening. You haven't been heeding. So listen carefully this time. It's a bit of reverse psychology. It's like the coach who says, oh, you're not man enough to do that. And the student responds either by quitting entirely or by trying harder, trying to hope, you know, to prove this coach wrong. And that happens in Bible prophecy too. Jonah said, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. And the people repented and it wasn't destroyed. Uh, Isaiah, or Jonah was a failure, but he was really a success at what God wanted him to do. And you might remember that Jesus quoted these words in verse 9. Uh, for his own ministry. He says, see, but don't understand. Listen, don't understand. He was explaining to the parables why he spoke in parables. Or to the, he was explaining to the disciples. So that these people might, what, listen but not understand? Uh, but this didn't mean that nobody understood anything at all. Large crowds do not gather to listen when they don't understand anything at all. They don't stay all day and get hungry uh, because with that, they're not understanding anything. It's like he was speaking a foreign language. Uh, well, he was. Uh, but it was the same language they spoke. Uh, they presumably understood part of what he was saying. Uh, if, if nobody understood it at all, we wouldn't call it teaching. What Jesus meant when he said he, he spoke in parables he was dealing with something that was difficult to understand, not that it was impossible. Some people understood it well enough to cheer for him. Other people understood it well enough to want to kill him. They were listening and understanding, but not liking it. So, and like in Isaiah, in verse 9, when he says, Hear what I say, but don't understand it, he is challenging the people to really listen, to do their best to understand you people haven't been getting the message before. You're acting like you don't understand. If you keep it up, something bad is going to happen to you. So listen. And in verse 10, God tells Isaiah more about what he is supposed to do. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull. Close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Isaiah can't do that. Isaiah can't make the person's heart calloused. However, a callous does happen uh, when something keeps rubbing against the skin. And your skin responds by getting thicker. God is telling Isaiah to keep on preaching. Be this squeaking wheel. Uh, be persistent 
And the people, a lot of the people are going to respond by making their hearts thicker, more resistant to the message. They're going to tune Isaiah out, ignore him, pretend not to see him. But if they don't ignore him, God says they would understand and repent and avoid the problems uh, that Isaiah was predicting. Isaiah was supposed to do his job, even if the people didn't do theirs. Isaiah was a success if he was faithful, even if the message failed to convince most of the people. Being faithful, even when it doesn't seem like you're accomplishing much, is in itself a sign of success. You are doing what God wants you to do. Sometimes we wonder today whether what we're doing is having much of a result. Uh, America is becoming less Christian year by year. More people are rejecting the message for whatever reason. We would like to have success. We would like to have numbers. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we don't. And we need to see that real success is simply doing what God tells us to do. We might like to have big numbers, but that's not our job. Our job is to do what he tells us to do. Sometimes we're like Peter who preached a sermon and 3,000 people respond. And, but other times we're like Paul who preached in Athens and most of the people scoffed. Uh, success isn't defined by the number of people who respond, but by whether we get up and try again. Uh, Paul was a success because he didn't give up. If he was rejected in one place, he'd go to another. If rejected by one people, he would go to another. He was willing kept on saying, here I am, send me. Verse 11, Isaiah asked, for how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitants, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged. In other words, keep preaching until there's nobody left to preach to. Verses 12 and 13, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. The whole nation is going to be decimated. But there's good news there. It's God told Isaiah, But as the terebinth tree and the oak leave stumps when they are cut down, and they sprout again later, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. There will be a holy seed. There will be people who are faithful, and they will in time grow again. Just do your job, Isaiah, because you are planting seeds that will grow after you are gone. You are part of the plan, Isaiah, and this is your part. Will you go? And Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. <clears throat> Father, you have called us to yourself. You want us to be with you forever. You want us to be like you forever. And as part of that, you give us jobs to do along the way, that we are involved in your work. You do not need our help, but we need the growth that comes with being part of your work. So help us be willing, help us be responsive, help us hear you clearly and understand so that we can respond and rejoice and we know that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. We thank you, praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.